So we'd shot probably six months of that robotic season. Then I thought we had a movie and we started cutting it and we did not have a movie. The community is beautiful yeah. all by itself. Right. It doesn't need a gimmick. Where do you start when you're going to tell a film about yourself? Mm -hmm. I think that's another reason why having a collaborator come from the outside can be helpful. Yeah, we may have the technology, but it doesn't mean that it's any easier than it's ever been to tell our stories. They're participating in creating their own stories, and you're giving them the opportunity to do so. Soro Films is a production company that supports emerging storytellers with all aspects of independent filmmaking. On this podcast, we interview filmmakers about their practical wisdom and experience in an effort to demystify the industry. Today, we're joined by Jared Jenkins, director and documentarian, and Ronnie Joe Draper, cultural advisor and producer, whose most recent film, Scenes from the Glittering World, just premiered at the 2021 Full Frame Documentary Film Festival. Is there something you want to start with, or I have? I do. I want to start with one thing. Sure. I do want to acknowledge that we're um, that we're on Indigenous land that often goes unacknowledged. That this is the um, the the, the the home of Shoshone, you and Paiute people, and it's being you know occupied by others. Um, but that we ought to acknowledge that always and be respectful mm. of of that fact. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for starting us with that. I think that's very very important. Um, what I was going to begin with, Ronnie Joe, was um, what was it like? hearing about this project early on was it scott christopherson who approached you and, and sort of told you a little bit about what we were up to and what we wanted to do or yeah i think it was i think it i think it was scott and i think it was sort of just like you know there was like a we want your eyeballs on it real you know kind of like a give it a glance uh -huh. sort of a deal <laughs> <laughs> which is that what it turned into <laughs> no no <laughs> but even in my mind i was like oh that's cute that the white guy wants me to give it a glance <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i know um from the beginning we knew we had to find the right collaborator and um we talked to numerous uh really awesome indigenous folks and when i met you i thought Something about Ronnie Jump, she seems to just have this intuition that none of us have. And I think a lot of that comes from your experiences as an indigenous woman, but also as an educator, that immediately I, something clicked where I realized there were parts of the film that we just didn't understand. And it was beyond just the indigenous aspect, it's also the educational aspect and how those two things relate. Because, um, yeah, we, I think oftentimes I go into a project uh a little bit definitely a little ignorant but through the process of making the film we get to explore those things and kind of learn ourselves mm -hmm. and uh in this project you were definitely one of those major forces that i think elevated all of us well i think going into a project ignorant can be super helpful right i mean i think that is you know that's where curiosity comes from yeah and if you go into a project with thinking that you've got a lot of answers, that's its own kind of blindness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's a good way of putting it. That that brings its own kind of problems. Mm -hmm. And um, and so you know, so that that isn't that isn't always trouble. Um, it can be a lot of trouble, but it's not. It's not <laughs> like. All trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it uh if if it were if we were to go in being ignorant but also not being willing to listen or change our sure. perspective or our direction. Sure. I think that would have been really problematic. But <clears throat> yeah, I think uh there is a temptation to just research everything you can before going into something. And I think there's a little bit of work that needs to be done there, but it is sort of nice to go in without expectation set and ready to sort of just embrace what comes so. yeah there's no way you could know everything about a location especially something so particular and remote yeah. you know about you know about where you went 
And I think it's important to note that even though I'm an indigenous person, I'm not, I'm not Navajo, I'm not Diné. And so, you know, I go in, I have to put myself in check as well and, and understand that I don't, I don't hold that expertise either. And that I have to go in with my own curiosities and my own ability to um, understand the limits of my knowledge within that setting as well, or else I can also get into trouble. Yeah, exactly. I, I, exactly. I, I love that. Um, I mean, we're both outsiders, really. Really? So, yeah. I think I'm able to, I think that. I think that my indigeneity offers me um, the ability to ask particular questions mm -hmm. that I think were, those questions were useful. You know, I remember asking a lot about, well, what about ceremony? What about ceremony? And like, you know, that, that, that had, that for, for me, you know, that had to, that had to matter here. Mm -hmm. um, and that you know that i didn't you know i didn't know the particulars maybe of of you know navajo um stories or navajo ceremony but you know i knew enough of my own stuff that i knew that it, it, it that it had to that had to be somewhere in here so there and maybe there's just or there was maybe a, a different knowledge of the questions to ask yeah yeah <clears throat> i think you you had a better instinct or a better uh, grasp on what we didn't know, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, was it, uh, I forget his name, but the there's the known knowns and the the known unknowns. I'm, I'm botching this terribly. But Errol Morris's film about um, McNamara, I believe was his name. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll just drop that thread right there. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's okay. the concept that, you know, sometimes you know what you don't know, and that's helpful. But what's more dangerous is when you don't know what you don't know. Sure. And uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is perhaps you knew what we didn't know. We didn't know what we didn't know. Right. Yeah. Right. And speaking of ceremony, that was an interesting point because, yeah, that was something we discussed. And I think it helped us understand scenes that we had in the film that we'd mm -hmm. already shot. We just didn't quite know what they meant yet. Right. Um, and an example of that are the butchering scenes in the film, where the first time it's being taught in the school, and the second time you see it, it's in daily practice. It's part of life, and you get to see how it's this event that brings the family together and allows for discourse. It's kind of a beautiful moment. Right, right. And how in the school, you know, when it's being taught, how the, the teacher, you know, makes space for helping the kids understand that this might feel different than how it feels at home. Yeah. And helps, helps the students negotiate that. And, um, and, and it would be easy to cut that out, you know, to mm -hmm. not think that, to not understand that that was something significant the mm -hmm. teacher was doing. Right. I think those sorts of scenes, it, it would be very easy to just turn them into a spectacle where mm -hmm. you could say, all right, white audiences, let's, let's gawk at this thing that's happening. For sure. Um, but I think that was something with your help, Christian and I really wanted to make sure we never let it go that direction ever, that it was something that was very respectful and you could see it in the way that maybe the instructor was trying to convey something that's really important. And even down to the details of how you place the animal's head, that matters, right. you know, it's about respect. So yeah, I, that's, I think ceremony, that's an interesting point. So I, I am, this has been something I've just been really interested in asking you. And I, we, we know each other a little bit, but this is the first time we've really worked together. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know a lot about you, but I am really curious it seems like you've done a lot. You've accomplished a lot of things in your career. Why make this shift now into filmmaking? Because maybe we should also mention that you're now producing another film, right? Right. And it's uh, maybe you could obviously be able to speak that way better than I can. But 
yeah, what what's shifted or, or what value do you see in, in kind of moving into this form of storytelling? So interesting because I um I just come to this place in my career, you know, I, I think in some ways I, I feel like I was maybe more of a a a good fit for the film than maybe even you all realize because of my, not just my indigenous background, but because of my background as an educator um, and then my background as a math and science teacher, um, you know, that, um, you know, that I understand like the engineering design cycle, like I, you know, that I, you know, so, so that robotics teaching would have been something that I, I really know something about. Like, so that, so that in that way, I was that I was kind of unicorny in a way, you know, mm -hmm. and so. Um, but at any rate, I've just kind of got to this point in my career where I where I just thought I need to do, I I just need to shift some things up and. Um, and I had told some some folks that I that I that I wanted to start um, making art, and I didn't really know what that meant really for me. Um, and then this opportunity came, which I thought was in my mind. I just thought it was funny. It just it, it <laughs> sort of cracked me up. What was the timeline like? You had this thought, and you were starting to make those shifts. And then, how between that point and when Scott approached you, what was the like a matter <clears throat> of months? Huh. Interesting. That was like <laughs> it was too soon. Like like maybe Scott had listened in on the conversation. Yeah. It was like huh, I got something for you. <laughs> So, um, and so, you know, so that it was, it was, it was in my mind that I thought, oh, I want to do some art making or I need to do some storytelling or, you know, that there were, there was something in there. Mm -hmm. And then when he approached me, even though this project seemed, um, you know, very weird for me, you know, <laughs> in terms of my background as a former math teacher, now a teacher educator, I just thought. Yeah, this is this is this is the step. Like, if you want to do if you want to do make art, like this is what you have to do. Like, you have to say yes to this project. <laughs> um, I think otherwise, if I hadn't had that thought, I maybe would have maybe maybe he would have called me and I would have said, "That's not what I do." You don't yeah. have you looked at my background? <laughs> <laughs> I have a degree in mathematics. Like this is not, <laughs> yeah. this is not what I do. So, um, so I think it just was like, it was just a very, the timing was also quite excellent. Hmm. And um, so, yeah, so just, it was, it was just really quite perfect. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you said yes. I am too. I, it's been very enjoyable and, it, and I feel like I've learned so much. And, and sometimes I feel like I've said things to you all, you know, at, at, you know, you know, when you've said, okay, well, you know, view this cut and then, you know, give us notes, you know, and I'm like, yeah, that sounds like something I can totally do. <laughs> and, and, you know, when I've given feedback, I've just thought, yeah, I don't even know what feedback in this situation looks like. Right. And so I don't even know if it's, I, I, I guess now, I, I guess I, now I can say it was probably helpful. Um, but at the time that I was giving it, I didn't know if it would be helpful that mm -hmm. I thought they might be getting this feedback and thinking, <laughs> what the, in the world <laughs> were we thinking? Like, this isn't helpful. Yeah. Well, but I guess it was helpful. Definitely, yeah, and I I think in in the ways that maybe you were kind of going through a learning like uh, your own learning curve, we were too, you know. So I I think it it worked out really well. Um, because yeah, but was I mean, it weird? Like, was was it different kind of notes than what you were accustomed to getting from someone who would give you feedback on a cut? I, I yes and no. I mean, because I think whenever we ask for feedback we we want to acknowledge like the angle of the person who's giving it to us and what like what they're going to be looking for like if i were to give it to another filmmaker who's a fellow cinematographer i know that he's going to or she's going to uh critique 
the camera work more than someone else. And um, I think we were really excited about your feedback because we always knew that it would have something that we weren't seeing as a team. Like Christian and I, we would like, oh, we didn't consider that that line might not be doing what we think it's doing, like in a classroom or something. And so, yeah, I, and I mean, it, not all of your feedback was um, helpful. <clears throat> <laughs> no, all <laughs> feedback's good, right? Um, it, not all of it was like you. You gave us very practical feedback too. Like this scene's boring. It's too long. <laughs> you know, it wasn't all like, uh, "Hey, this might not be sensitive." Or some of that was right, there right. for sure. But it, you know, there was also practical feedback that comes from a producer. <laughs> you know, which when we sent you a three-hour cut, I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it, it, it got there. It, it, it sure. got trimmed. So I appreciate that you wanted to shift and, and art is something that I guess was speaking to you. What do you hope to accomplish with it? Like what, because obviously it's a tool. It can mm -hmm. be a tool. Is there something specific that you're hoping to accomplish with filmmaking or with like shifting your, your storytelling? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the work that I've done in the past, you know, I'm an academic, that the the writing that I've done has been primarily for other academics. I, um, you know, I think that that has had its particular use. Um, but I also think I have words in me and stories in me that can speak to people who aren't just academics. And so... I want, I've just been thinking about, well, you know, so how do I do that? How do I, how do I share the stories that I have with people outside of academia? You know, and how would I go mm -hmm. about doing that? Um, you know, right before Scott approached me, I had just finished a sabbatical on, um, on Yurok lands. You know, I'm Yurok and I, spent time on um, my traditional lands, my, does that, does that doesn't make sense, on the reservation where my father grew up and where my family still is. And I was doing autoethnography work, looking at my own life, looking at my, looking at my experience in education hmm. and how was how did my education continue to colonize me? Hmm. Um, how did I experience that? And so then through the process of that, I knew that I had to tell stories that made sense as, um, because that was a, that's a traditional way of going about mm -hmm. doing work that made sense as a Yurok person. And then I turned to poetry as a storytelling um, method. Okay. But then I thought, you know, I don't really know how to share poetry. I, I, that's not my my jam, you know. I don't. And so, the, but, and, the, and and then that's where I started thinking. Oh, I, I've got. I'm I'm starting to create art. Like I need to think about how do I share art? How do I? Mm -hmm. I'm creating art. I want to share art. And that's when Scott contacted me, and I was huh. like, Oh, here, maybe let me learn how to do this new thing. Yeah. And so that 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 got me going. Yeah. Huh. It was really a decisive moment. This window of time was really was yeah. opportune for us, really. Yeah. To come at you at this time. Yeah, yeah. It's opportune for me as well. It was just a really, <clears throat> I felt like, um, I felt, I, I felt like you all were giving me a chance hmm. and that I had an opportunity to step up and, and learn and to take a chance. And to be like a, a learner in this process. Hmm. That's, that's really great to hear that. It's also interesting because the way it felt for me was it was. Um, uh, I guess I felt similar where I felt like I was able to interact with an expert on, mm. on in areas that I was completely unfamiliar with, you know. Um, so I, I guess it's nice that it was it was a mutual uh, coming together in a way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I it was interesting too because I remember thinking, you know, as I was watching the 
you know, those early, um, you know, the early cuts of the movie, you know, I didn't, I, you know, I had seen all of the, you know, I hadn't been part of the whole process. Yeah. We had done probably six months of production before we'd met. Right. And you yeah. had all the, Lots the filming and yeah. I'd, I'd never been down mm -hmm. to Navajo mountain. I'd never met the young people. Mm -hmm. I'd never, I hadn't been in on the conceptualization. You know, I really felt really tentative in terms of what I could say, eh, scrap this. <laughs> no. Yeah. You know, and I remember early on thinking, ah, this robotics angle, it's not that interesting. <laughs> yeah. But it, I didn't it took feel, us a while to grapple but with it, that. But it didn't feel yeah. like it was my project to say that, you know? Yeah. I didn't feel like it was my place to to say, you know, throw that away. I really felt like this was your story, that you were that you had been there, that you had mm -hmm. spent all that time and that you this was your story that you were putting together and I really wanted to make sure that I was honoring that also. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so that I was really trying to, you, you know, that you, you clearly had a vision about what you wanted this, this film to be. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, I wanted to honor that because I, I could see that you, you had something hmm. and, that I wanted, and I I didn't want, I I didn't want to take that away from you, I, you know, yeah. because I because I, I could tell that you, and especially since when I when I see the cuts, you know, it was so beautiful what you were doing, you know, the cinematography was so beautiful, it was so lovely. I didn't want to, I I I, <laughs> I, I knew there was something there, you know. Yeah, 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 and I mean that's sort of been it's become one of the maybe defining challenges of the project that it's in the process of of working through the challenge it sort of helped the film become what it is it become one of the uh the defining traits of the film really is the fact that we started it with this framework in mind that robotics in this community could be a lens to explore the community and then it took us like, you know, probably a year of, you know, really battling the idea that maybe you don't need the robotics lens to explore the community. Just let the their stories and their lives be a lens for them themselves. Yeah. The community is beautiful. Yeah. All by itself. Right. It doesn't need a gimmick. Exactly. And early on, it was, it, I think the biggest challenge was knowing that <clears throat> that angle is compelling on paper. And it's compelling to investors. Sure. And it's compelling to gatekeepers who might say, okay, I, I understand why you as an outsider are coming to this place. Yeah. You know, when I think deep down from the beginning, what really attracted me to the community was its remoteness, the isolation, um, it having sort of mirroring some of my own experiences, being such a rural community with a very small school. I mean, there are things that really attracted me personally. And then, you know, then you can start adding on all these layers. Well, it's also an indigenous community. And that's really interesting because it's, it's in Utah. And, right. but I'd never heard of this before. And I grew up in Utah, you know? Um, so yeah, in a way it felt like there were enough things there that we never needed robotics, but it was sort of a crutch in the mm -hmm. beginning, I think. And it, it took a little bit of um, bravery and some nudging to to finally move on from it and 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 kind of pursue what the our 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 stars of the film were interested in themselves. Right. You know? But the storytellers were what they were interested in exactly. telling you. Yeah. And 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 kind of letting them instruct us where should we film, what should we talk about, you know. It kind of opened things up because early on it was interesting when we'd be filming about robotics. It's very easy to have your questions and have your angle, and you kind of want to start documenting things very chron chron uh, chronologically. Oh, yep. And and it it's tempting to start shoehorning things into that narr narrative where it's like you know today 
to feel successful as a filmmaker, I need to capture this milestone. And it has to do with the robotic season. But once we'd scrapped that, so we'd shot probably six months of that robotic season. Then I thought we had a movie and we started cutting it and we did not have a movie. We had a three hour <laughs> mess. <laughs> and once we'd scrapped it and I started going back to the community and I started approaching certain scenes totally differently. And in fact, another thing that we that I think would be interesting to talk about is once we scrapped that, I actually started paying Granite, Noah, and L for their time. We, I basically said, you're collaborators, you're our crew. We are going to do this. Uh, it's, this is going to move in both directions, so we're going to pay you for your time. And I know that's sort of a question journalistically. It's, there's an ethical question there, but uh, I felt that this was an appropriate thing to do because we're not so concerned with journalistic integrity here. We're interested in being fair with their time. It's a new, but it's a new, it's a new ethical question. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's true. Because it, you know, there, it's it's a different. You know, you're looking at a community that has, you know, been colonized enough you know that resources have been taken and taken and taken and then to to take again yes and i i wasn't interested in in um mentally dealing with the possibility that i had gone into a community harvested from it sure and then sold my harvest yep. elsewhere i thought i i i could physically do it but I didn't want to deal with the mental repercussions of that. And, you know, if, if we can do something about it, let's do something about it. Right. So things shifted that this all pretty much started the summer after the school season ended and, um, and robotics was, we fully moved on from it. And so a lot of the scenes that came from this period were totally different and they make up the majority of the movie now. And they're more of a, uh, aligned with what I'd hoped to accomplish from the beginning, something that's very intimate, joyful at times, po as positive as we can, um, or, or not that we're trying to make things positive. We're just allowing the positivity to show through that's there. Sure. You know, I think there's, I, I watched a few films in, as I researched how to approach this and too often the films that I saw that dealt with indigenous life were so dour mm -hmm. and they were, like kind of unabashedly, like even down to the music, the tone that would be set just sort of felt uh, uncomfortable. Right. And I, this is, I'm a white guy and I don't even understand all the implications beyond what I've, you know, outside of just my learned experience. I don't, I haven't lived that. And so, and I know our film's probably not perfect. There's probably a lot of things that we could have done better. <laughs> I'm sure there are, but, um, yeah, that that's a big part of it. And... No, but I remember watching it and th and thinking and tr and and saying more joy, more joy. Yeah, these kids are funny. These kids are smart. More <laughs> joy, more joy. Yeah, absolutely. And that's funny because L was an interesting development when we finally started filming with her, because I was about halfway through the robotic season, and I told the team that I found a new character and she's not on the robotics team, but I'm going to film her anyway. And I think some individuals are a little confused by that. Like, why, why, why are you going to spend time with someone that's not going to have anything to do with the film? But instinctually something just connected where I was like, this girl's got it going on. She's so funny, mm -hmm. so charming. And she's not alone. I, all the kids are, you know, she just sort of was able to express that for us on camera. Right. So we had to just take the risk. And I didn't know how she was going to weave into the film. Well, I remember one time when I was a girl, my um, my grandma said to me, I don't know why there aren't more television shows that just are like Indian families. We're funny. <laughs> like, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but. People aren't tapping into the funny, you know, they, when right. they come to the reservation, they, they see, you know, they see what they see, 
which may be, you know, has to do with the things that are there, you know, the poverty and, and mm -hmm. you know, whatever trauma or whatever hard things they see, but they're also just not seeing the delight and the humor mm -hmm. and the ingenuity and, you know, mm -hmm. all the other amazing things that are also happening. Yeah. I, I think uh, all too often, and I'm not trying to knock any filmmakers for doing this because it's obviously extremely helpful. It can be extremely useful to make films for activism. And, you know, you can kind of frame things mm -hmm. around an issue and that's super helpful, but I, that felt wrong to try and do that with this film and this community to come in as an outsider and try and play white savior, I guess. Sure. And, and uh, well, there's you know. kind of like a poverty porn kind of yeah. deal that happens in filmmaking that is insulting. And, um, and then there's this notion, you know, that of like, well, you know, if what can we do to help those young people get off the reservation? Well, why? That's why their home. Why, yeah. why do they need to leave? <laughs> you know, nobody comes into Provo and, and says, what do we do to help these young people leave Provo? Or how do yeah. we do to get these young, help these young people leave the United States? Like, do, do we understand that that would be um, illogical, mm -hmm. right? That, you know, what can we do to help these young people grow up and thrive and be able to um, live in such a way that they can contribute to helping to make their community strong and healthy? That's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> that we yeah. often don't ask. Um, um, it, it reminds me of a conversation I had with Leonora, Granite's mother, where I asked her, I said, from your perspective, what do you think is would be best for Granite when he graduates from high school? And she said, I want him to go get skills and get educated in whatever field he is, he is excited about. But then I want him to bring him back here. We need those skills to return. And so and we kind of talked about how in her life, she, after high school, she joined the Navy and she gained. And I'm, I don't know if I'm not necessarily advocating that that's like the route sure, to go or sure. anything, but she saw the world, she gained experiences and she's brought those home. And she said she's brought those skills to her family and she's tried to, uh, I guess, um, invest all those things that she learned into her, her child, Granite. And I thought that was kind of a beautiful way of looking at it. And, and that's not what you normally hear. It seems like it's normally... But you don't normally hear that from white folks. True. That's a, yeah. And for me as a white, as a white guy that me hearing that was kind of like one of the first times I was hearing that perspective from an indigenous woman mm -hmm. or indigenous person. Being like, okay, that's, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> right. Because I think that we hear from white folks, like we've got to remove children from the reservation that they'd be better off. Yeah. Off reservation. But that's essentially saying you'd be better off outside of your homelands. You'd be better off away from your family, you, you know. Yeah. Um, and this is particularly difficult given that we're just, you know, this is this week we're, you know, we're, we're, we're getting news from Canada, you know, where we're where they've, you know, found the remains of over 200 children who were removed from their families, uh, you know, because well-meaning white people thought it would be best to remove right. these children from the reservations, from their homelands, from their families, and put them in residential schools off the reservation. And clearly, that it wasn't. <laughs> no. It wasn't the best. And, um, you know, and so, I, you know, I, I, I never want that to be what the world hears. I mean, and that's, and that's its own kind of activism, you mm -hmm. know, to hear that it might be okay for kids to grow up and thrive 
and to make a beautiful life with their families in their homelands in in the place of their of their people while not everything is you know hunky dory there it doesn't mean that they can't be better and that that is a story of resistance as well and just because a lot of filmmakers choose not to um share that story doesn't mean it's not an important story to put out into the world so um so you had your whole family with you on the reservation yeah so what was that like how tell us first of all tell me like tell me about your family makeup like your yeah so um my partner carly jakins is uh also she's also a filmmaker and is one of my closest collaborators and that's why this film is very much our film and it's sometimes I'm a little bit like, why isn't she here? You know, which uh, I try to correct that as much as I can. Um, but for this film in particular, she's was very happy to just sort of she wanted to kind of um, be a little hands off, a little. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but um, anyway, she so she's a close collaborator, and she we've made it all of our short films every film i've made up till now she's been a big part of it and often co-directs with me um and then we have two children vivian and donovan and they are just so much fun vivian's seven and donovan is three no four he's four <laughs> get that right Don sorry Dad. donovan and uh yeah so for the majority of the film i mean one of the challenges of the film early on was figuring out how to do production because it's so far away. Mm -hmm. And at first we thought, well, maybe we'd stay in Page, Arizona and commute into the community, which is interesting because a lot of the people that live in Navajo Mountain have to commute away for work to Page right. or to the other near. Uh, and Page is about the same distance as any other community that has work there. And so you're, you're looking at two hours, both uh, one, one way, four hour round trip every day for work and we as a team felt that that was not possible unreasonable unreasonable yeah <laughs> gotta get up that early to go to school <laughs> and so luckily for us um the the school district built teachers housing to accommodate teachers coming to the community to to work there and they had uh, an empty unit and the district allowed us to move into it which was really amazing because it allowed us to literally live right there. We could walk to the high school every morning with our gear and film. And so it, it allowed us an access and um, a proximity to the, the community that was just, it seemed impossible before. Um, looking back, what I would do now is I would find a family and ask if we could may be you know like maybe pay to be hosted or something because i think that would have in some ways been a, a boon to the community they or could to have thrown family. some more funds into exactly. the community yeah um but it, it took us a while to realize that that was a possibility um but anyway uh yeah we i'm trying to remember at the time the ages of my children because we looked at enrolling my daughter in the school in the community um I think it would have been for preschool, so she must have been five. I, I can't remember. <laughs> Four-ish. Four-ish, five-ish. Yeah, uh, but it was really rewarding being down there with them uh, because as I would get to know a family, myself personally, for instance, Granite's family, um, my children also did, and they interacted with all the cousin brothers and sisters that mm -hmm. are having a blast mm -hmm. every day with each other. And it was, I mean, that kind of experience, you, you can't replicate that, you yeah. know? And so in order for, for them to be able to experience that and kind of get a taste of that was a joy and uh, something that you, you just, you can't get elsewhere. And you, it's, you know, you couldn't. There's a particular kind of freedom. Yeah. On a reservation. Yeah. That I don't think if you're not living there. And you don't see it like through the eyes, maybe of your even your own children, mm -hmm. that you don't, you know, if you didn't experience it yourself as a child, that you don't 
you can't really know, right. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think it, it was also it, it, being able to expose our family and children to just different cultural practices, you know, saying today we're going to be filming a butchering. They're going to kill the sheep and then we're going to eat it later. Right. And that's something that I think by and large, we as a society are completely removed from. And so, it, you know, there's little things like that that you just can't replicate. And I'm just, it's just we're so fortunate that we're able to do that. Um, right. Yeah. There's something about like really knowing where your food comes from. <laughs> Being connected to it. Yeah. Like, right. Today, we're going to eat the sheep with the blue ribbon. And right. And, you know, uh, yeah, it's it's, it's not a. Uh, it's, it's not an abstract thing. Right, right. And I come from a community that I, my community is famous for wool growers, sheep farmers. And still, that's not something that we see ever. You don't see the slaughtering and it's not talked about. Um, but yeah, and, and my family, they help with filming too. I mean, I usually am very careful to cut around them because I don't want them to physically be present in the film because sure. I it, that's not what this is about. Right. Um, but you'll often hear them playing in scenes. They're playing with friends. Like, uh, for instance, in the film, the orchard scene where Granite is picking apricots with his family, I can hear my children playing in the background. Oh. So it's a nice little Easter egg for, for me, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's a collaborative experience for my family. And I hope that they... Don't grow tired of it because <laughs> they come along for the ride. So Nice. Nice. Yeah. So interviewing um, indigenous kids. How'd yeah. that go? <laughs> Talk to me about that. Uh, I It was a learning experience for me. I had to adjust my approach, really. I mean, I think a lot of documentarians that have come from some sort of formal background, I went to film school, you kind of get taught how to ask questions mm -hmm. and you're taught methods to encourage answers that are easy to work with. Sure. Answers that are easy to cut. You, you, you learn how to hone in on sound bites. Yeah. If, if you know what I mean. And uh -huh. early on, I would approach my interviews that way. Granted, please put your put my question in your answer. Here's my question. <laughs> and and that just didn't work. They right. just wouldn't have it. They wouldn't have it. And and that's not anything against them. It's it was just my approach was wrong. Right. They were prepared and ready to respond when I would approach them in the right way. Right. And I found I think the best example is with L. Because she had, she even had a very distinct way that I would approach the ways I'd want to talk with her. And I learned very quickly that with Elle, you embrace the chaos. You embrace the fun that's happening there in that setting. Don't fight it. You don't fight it. Let Rick my her brother, terrorize her a little bit. Don't try and control everything. Just let it unfold in front of the camera, be hands off. And um, really, it just came down to, yes, asking questions, but uh really conversationally you know mm -hmm. with no expectations and because in a, in a way it'd be frustrating if i w wanted a specific answer i would be frustrated when i didn't get it and that's on help like that's not helping anyone that's not helping the film it's fruitless so in l if you allow her to just go and have fun and, and talk about things she's interested in and i and I learned I could just sort of seed a few thoughts. I could just, she would start talking and I'd say, oh, what about this? You know, I, I don't remember specifics right now, but, and she could riff on that and she could expound on it way better than I could have formulated for her to say it. Right. And um, Christian, our editor, Christian Jensen, he might get a kick out of this because early on, as I started working with L, I was sending him scenes where I'd lock the camera down and I'd let her and her brothers and sisters just kind of own the show, take us where they wanted to go. And I would try and nudge it along when I felt the need. And uh, I also made the odd decision to not shoot cover it like B-roll, which is another practice that oh, right, right. filmmakers often do so that they can cover cuts. And with Elle, 
something just clicked. I don't know if it was intuition or I, I don't know, but I decided I didn't want to do that. I wanted to just uh, show those cuts, show us kind of um, refining things when we did or omitting things when we did so that we were kind of showing our cards in a way saying, this is like, you can see the artifice in what we're doing as filmmakers. Um, and you, this also, I think it, that style sort of is accentuated her, um, just the vibrancy of the family there. You know, they're just having so much fun and they're so engaged with each other. Right. So. Well, I think it has to be, I think, within, but I don't, I don't want to just say like within indigenous communities, although I think that it, it, it feels like that so much for me, it, that, that there has to be sort of a reciprocity. There has to be, it needs to be more of a dialogue mm -hmm. that, you know, um, you know, busting out a bunch of questions in sort of a, you know, I'm going to ask you questions and I'm going to sit here silently listening to your answers. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, really participate in a conversation. It, it doesn't really make sense. Um, and I found myself, you know, on the film I'm working with on Yurok lands in a similar situation. And and I felt it was sort of mat. It, it was um, magnified by the fact that I was also in conversation with people I knew, in some cases, people who were family. Hmm. And so then that felt really artificial to just sort of ask them questions and then, you know, sit there silently. You know, yeah. I just I finally told the director that I'm working with. Okay, I'm just gonna. Uh, we're gonna have conversation, and you, it's gonna be your problem. <laughs> yeah. To cut around yeah. it, you know, you you make it work. It's. I'm gonna I'm gonna Fair do what enough. I do, and you do what you do, and yeah, we'll we'll get this done. But yeah. um, it doesn't make sense for me to pretend like I don't know things and ask some kind of convoluted question and um try to stop them and say, okay, can you say that again? With, but this time without pronouns, um, you know, <laughs> you know, use proper words and everything yeah. that you're saying. Um, and so the storyteller and the story listener need to be present together mm -hmm. and in, in conversation yeah. in those spaces. And I think that, uh, I mean, it sounds like to me that you experience that. Yeah. And well, I what you made me think of was, um, yeah, both need to be present with each other, but that doesn't necessarily mean that <clears throat> my voice has to be in the film. Of or course. Your, you know, there's of ways course. we have, we have the technology. We have tools. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I, uh, I remember us, uh, Christian, when he first started seeing some of these scenes, he kind of asked me like, what, what do you want me to do with this? And, um, I basically just said, we just got to let these things play out and we're going to, we'll cut them up, but, uh, this is how they're going to be. This is how else we're going to, we're going to let her run the show when it comes to us bringing the camera there. And I, and Christian's an incredible editor. And often he'd kind of ask me for some specific things like, oh, it'd be great if we could have some of these things, you know, like if, if they could phrase this more clearly. And I agree when you're in the edit room, you kind of want that clarity. Sure. You want closure when you can get it. Um, but you make sacrifices sometimes when you compromise with your subjects and kind of, um, give them more power in the situation. It's well, easy think, to be controlling as a director. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that in this way, you're co-creating this story and in, in, in a way, then these young people are, you know, and I'm not, I, I hesitate to to refer to them as subjects that, that, that mm. it's maybe better to, to refer to them as participants. Participants. Yeah. Excellent. You know, they're participating in creating their own stories and you're, you know, giving them the opportunity to do so, mm -hmm. you know, um, and teenagers, you know, young people don't often get the opportunity to share their own stories. Mm -hmm. How would they how would they have the opportunity to do that? Um, you know, it's not like they own a bunch of lenses and mm -mm. editing <clears throat> facilities and 
you know, you know, even, you know, take apart, take away the, the fact that they're, that they're res kids or that they're, you know, in this super remote location, um, you know, think, you know, the, the fact that they're, that they're young people mm -hmm. and they don't have access to that technology to be able to, to tell the story of what is life like for them right now as teenagers. Yeah. Um, they just don't get to tell that story. Yeah. Because um, unless somebody says, hey, yeah, let's collaborate in a way mm -hmm. on, on telling this story. And, but you have, to, you have to have the courage to do that. Yeah. I think more than ever we are, it, most people have phones and we have tools and a lot of people kind of tout like, hey, you can make a movie because you have all the power in your pocket, in your phone. And I think, yeah, that's true to an extent. But after having shared the film with our participants, um, maybe the common sentiment was this idea that they weren't I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. They uh, they wouldn't have seen how universal and interesting their stories were on their own mm -hmm. in a vacuum, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, and I'm not trying to take credit for that, saying that I could see that they're more interesting than they see themselves. But in a way, I think right. as a filmmaker coming in and seeing something and then the, maybe at the moment they weren't seeing it themselves did empower them in a way. And that is something that we can do as filmmakers is, is, um, yeah, I should figure out how I want to say that, but <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a little I, convoluted. I, yeah. I, and I, I get like trying to kind of maintain the humility of that. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 <clears throat> but I'm trying to imagine like a group of teenagers sitting around in a high school with their iPhones and their garage band software right. yeah. putting together a documentary about their lives and like bing bang boom, they're at full frame showing their <laughs> movie to the world. Like that doesn't that's not how right. the world isn't set up for young people to no. share their stories like that. Right. And and what aspects of their stories, you know, I mean, where do you start? when you're going to tell a film about yourself. I mm -hmm. think that's another reason why having a collaborator come from the outside can be helpful in a sense. But yeah, I mean, yeah, we may have the technology, but it doesn't mean that it's any easier than it's ever been to tell our stories, our own stories. For instance, Granite, well, all of them really made comments like, I loved learning more about Noah. I never... Like, I have always liked Noah, but man, he's really interesting, you know? Right. And I'm like, well, so are you. Because <laughs> uh, Noah told me he was, he loved your part of the film. He loved learning more about you. And I think there was a, like a little bit of realization, like, wow, yeah, I am, I am really interesting. And I, I love seeing that because that's sort of what I was hoping to communicate to them from the beginning is, uh, I'm not doing you a favor. You're doing me a favor. You are sharing some of you with us. And that's what is so special. Like, um, yeah, your stories really are powerful. You just don't know it yet. But I don't want, I'm trying to say this in a humble way. Right, you know, right. I don't have a special skill for this or anything. So I think that the outside perspective sometimes can help in that way. Even if the outside perspective is coming from your own family, like in your case, um, mm -hmm. you might, as you're talking to your own family members with your current project, you might know ways to frame some of their experiences that amplifies them. Right. Right. Well, and that's probably true for all of us that we, we don't know how um, interesting or remarkable we are, mm -hmm. you know, that we um, we're going about our daily lives mm -hmm. thinking this is all ho-hum. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and that's something that I just love that my ideal film is exalting the everyday in a way. And and um, like looking at the banal 
in some things and, and seeing the beauty in that. Mm -hmm. Like, it's hard for me to get behind a film, and no offense, I'm not trying to throw shade at him, but like to get behind a film that is tracking Taylor Swift or something. No offense to her, but like, yeah, I'm just. Yeah, yeah. There's some, there's some like daily banality to her life. Yeah. And if <laughs> that would be the movie I'd want to see, you know, like the really boring parts of being a superstar. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great, but like the concerts and the you know, all the really flashy, glitzy things. There's so much of that. I don't think we champion the little things enough. And that, yeah. So I'm starting to ramble now, but that's something that I like to do in my work is really be able to just spend time with those things that we might take for granted, or that just seem so absolutely ordinary, but in the right framing, they seem profound. Yeah, years ago I was at the um the uh, Alamo Museum mm -hmm. and there was a display of um keys. Keys. Yeah. Okay. And I and I thought, you know, at the time that these keys were made nobody thought like, oh, these are going to be on display sometime. <laughs> People are going to like stand and like look at these keys. Yeah. You know, so sometimes I look at the items like that I carry on a regular basis. You know, maybe my credit cards or um, whatever that I'm getting rid, you know, that would get to get rid of when they're expired or whatever and think, you know, someday maybe someone's going to want to put these on display that they're those, yeah. those everyday <laughs> items are going to be, you know, someone's going to want to stop and say, well, oh my gosh, look at those. Like, look at that. You yeah. know, that those those are going to be the interesting things, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that people are, are, are going to treasure. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, what was school like what, for you? You know, right. what, 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 what did you study? You know, what was it like to pick apricots? What mm -hmm. was it, what was it like to butcher a sheep? What was, what it, what kind of car did you drive? You know, all those like little particulars that we we don't notice about our own lives because we're in the middle of living them. Mm -hmm. You know, later, you know, our children or our grandchildren are really interested in them, in those things. And maybe we don't have that documented. We don't have photos of them or we don't, um, you know, we don't have those around anymore. <laughs> and we wish that we did or, you know, somebody in our lives wish wishes that we did. Yeah. Because that turns out to be some of the, the interesting, <laughs> you know, the interesting things about us. Yeah, that reminds me of, um, so my family, we, uh, we moved from South Africa to the United States when I was almost three years old. And uh, when we first arrived, we were a little bit destitute, I guess. We were, luckily had some family here already that were able to help us, but because of visa restrictions and things my dad essentially just couldn't work so we had no money um but just recently i asked my dad to do a little exercise for me because growing up we would always like every year get a new crappy used car like just the worst car in town but we would just like kind of cycle through them they're just like disposable and so i had my dad count i i asked him like how many cars do you think we had growing up and he, <laughs> it was a fascinating exercise. And, and he was like, why would you want to know that? Like, why do you care? I was like, I'm just, this is, to me, this is so interesting. Like, what, what cars did we have? How many did we have? You know? And so he sat down and we kind of started going through the list and we got up to like 30 or something. What? And it was outrageous. Yes. But it was so interesting. And it, to my dad, it was like, this is not good information. Like, this is maybe even embarrassing. Don't be but... telling. Don't don't be making a podcast about <laughs> don't, this. Don't tell this to people. <laughs> but I was, you know, to me that that's like uh, part of my identity in a way. It's part of um, my personal history and how I understand myself in the world and those details. I want to know. Right. And, and so yeah, I think there's lots of things that um, to a lot of the people involved in that personal history they don't care because they just lived it right, but. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes there's so much value in in someone coming to try and make meaning out of that. Yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. And what a treasure! I think, I hope, I hope that for 
you know, for these young people. I hope it, I hope that this film is a treasure for them. Yeah. Like if it, if it, even if nobody else enjoys the film, I have enjoyed it. But if, even if nobody else does, I hope that it's a treasure for them. And I hope that, 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 you know, that their children, their grandchildren, their nieces and nephews will enjoy watching it. That they'll, that they'll, that, that, that will bring them joy, that they will have pleasure in that. I think that if it does nothing else, that that will be a beautiful reason for the film to exist. Yeah, I, it's, that does bring up a really interesting note that I wonder if we should talk about it at all. Um, and perhaps this gets edited out, I don't know. But uh, in the case of Granite's family, since we we finished production, they lost another one of their sons. And so watching the movie for them was a very emotional experience. Sure. And Leonor and I were able to discuss that a little bit. And ultimately, she said she felt good about it because it was like a time capsule in a way of happy moments from her son's life. She can see him playing and she can remember him in those ways. And, and I, I don't know if the film you know, is like a tool in any way for her in terms of, you know, remembering her son. I'm sure she doesn't need the film at all. Sure. But, um, yeah, I, I know for their family, at least, it will be kind of a different experience. And, and yeah, I just, yeah, it's been something I've had a lot of anxiety about because, as you can imagine, that's a, uh, that's a, obviously a, a, a tragedy and, and, having it part of it, your son's life recorded or a film. Yeah, I, I still don't quite know what to make of it, but I'm very grateful that Leonora was okay with it. And she actually said that she was a lot happier and felt um, more positive than she'd expected after finishing the movie. I think she was uh, expecting seeing her son to be... Uh, maybe more painful than it ended up being. Mm. I don't know. I don't want to put words in her mouth. Yeah, but... can't speak for her. Yeah. And I think, I think Christian and I were prepared for the idea that if, if this was too painful for Leonora, we would come up with a solution to um, rework the film in a way that was less painful for her if it caused her any grief, mm -hmm. you know, seeing her son. But I think... Diedrich was just such a positive, bubbly kid that that's, that comes out in the film and you can kind of feel that from him in the film. And uh, maybe that's a great memorial to him. I don't know. I, I don't know. Right. But yeah, it's quite sad that uh, such a small community, I mean, there's just a lot of trauma and tragedy. Uh, let me phrase this a little differently. Um, of the 30 students that were at the high school while we were filming there, I mean, there were two deaths mm -hmm. in the six months after we finished um, production. And so those individuals are in the film, you know? And so, yeah, it's a little bit of a dilemma, just worrying about not wanting to cause anyone any undue grief by having documented something, but <laughs> it's something I think we're still grappling with, but. Well, that's real, real. Yeah. I do want to ask you what it was like meeting them, our, our participants. For the, oh. Maybe we interject really quick with that. And I, I know it's still virtual. It's still virtual. I, I want to meet them in real life. I want to hug on them. I want to <laughs> let them know how awesome they are. I want them to know that I'm awesome. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> As I feel like they don't know that yet. Um, yeah, it, I feel like, um, I, cause I feel like even the medium, you know, when we were meeting over zoom, that that was, maybe they were overwhelmed with the mm -hmm. zoom aspect of it yeah. and not really able to, you know, <laughs> meet in 
chat. Yeah, Zoom has barriers anyway, but then to right. know that the person that is greeting you knows a lot about you. Yeah, that's weird. And you don't know them yet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's no way that they can know, like, how often I watch that film, like, mm -hmm. you know, how much I know. Yeah. Right. You've seen what's been cut out. You know, you know. Right. Yeah. You know, so I'm, I would imagine that I was just like a weird, creepy lady. <laughs> That was like fangirling that, in a but... bizarro way. <laughs> I'm sure they felt a little of your warmth. Sure. A little bit of it maybe came over the Zooms. <laughs> I, I hope so. Huh. That'll come. So Yeah, yeah. I I'll hope ask so. you again. I when, hope so. Yeah, I hope it's comes. great. Yeah. I hope it is. I hope that they know how much I appreciate them and, um, you know, just know that they're amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, uh, maybe we'll just frame it this way. Now that the film's done, what are your, what would be the ideal scenario for this film? What kind of impact do you hope the film can make? You know, I think, I think I'm with Ill, like, L. Mm -hmm. Um, That I want the, um, I want more Native representation out there. I want people to know that we exist. Yeah. And. And to know that um, indigenous people are, you know, that they they deal with hard things, but they also deal with that they deal with it in ways that are clever and um, funny. That they that they and that they want to solve problems in in their ways, um, and so. You know, we just don't, we just haven't seen that. You know, we just haven't, we don't, we just don't see enough of that. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the the stuff that I'm working on now is about that too. It's about, um, you know, what are people on Yurok lands doing in terms of continuing to care for, for land and to bring their knowledge of, um, land keeping back and mm -hmm. to, um, you know, what, what, and what can they do to share that with the rest of the world? I yeah. think that, um, again, you know, not about, you know, there is trauma there. There is, there's hard things, but there's also, you know, smart things and beautiful things. And, um, you know, I want to be able to share that balance. Mm -hmm. And I, and to be able to show indigenous people as as whole people, yeah, who are existing now in the nowadays, yeah, and not just in the past, mm -hmm. and who are existing in in their wholeness. And I, I mean, it, it's if anyone would ever expect an, anything less from another human what we want them to be or what we want, how we want them to be seen is just, it's absurd. And it's too bad because then we end up missing out, you know, that if we say, well, I, I, I don't want to know your full indigeneity or I don't want to know, I, I'll, I'll, I don't, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to know, I'll know you in your indigeneity, but I don't want to know you in your, in sort of your, maybe your mixed background, hmm. you know, like, like, oh, there's an Asian part of you too? Like, I don't want to know that part. Like, just talk, talk, <laughs> talk to me about your indigenous part. And I don't know about your Asian part. Oh, but there's just this queer part too. Like, I don't want to know about that. Like, yeah. that's too, much too, too complicated. Yeah. It's like, get, like, give me one part. But, but a person never comes to us as one part of themselves. They come, mm -hmm. they're, you know, they, you don't get to drop off a part of yourself at the door. You, you come in your fullness and, and, we we ought to be able to enjoy that about people. Well, if um, like so anyone who is listening to this, thank you, and yes. I hope that you can see the film and and uh, take what you will from it. You know, I hope you enjoy it. I hope it makes you think more about uh, our indigenous brothers and sisters that 
we don't listen to enough. Yeah. Think about whose land you're on. I think if everybody who saw it, like, thought about, you know, whose land do they occupy right now? Who are the young people, the indigenous young people around them? What are they up to right now? Just do a little thought experiment there. I think that would be, that would be good. And it's it's a little bittersweet because the film is going to be premiering at, at Full Frame, which is a wonderful festival that we're very excited to be a part of. But it's, the bittersweetness comes in thinking about how it's going to be a virtual event. And, um, you know, you you typically kind of imagine a premiere can be, like, you know, something where you can be with other people and kind of celebrate the film. Gather and, together. And gather, yeah. And, and see how people respond to these stories and how they respond right. to Elle and Granite and Noah. And that's something I've been so excited for. And so, you know, there's a little, there's a, a tinge of sadness that it'll be something that people are going to be experiencing privately. Right. But I, at the same time, I'm just so grateful that it's actually like, we're going to share the film and what more could we really ask for? Well, and I think even for indigenous communities, you know, for folks who are, you know, who wouldn't no normally have access to yeah. film festivals, mm -hmm. you know, this is a situation that allows access to a film festival that normally folks wouldn't have. Exactly. I hope in the future that film festivals are at least some sort of a hybrid situation where people can can go and experience them in person, but that yeah. they, that people can also um, experience them remotely so yeah. that, so that, you know, they are, you know, in a situation where, you know, getting there physically isn't really possible, that they still have some way of accessing yeah. all these stories. We shouldn't just, you know, it should be limited by geography at this point, you know. In we have the we have we, the we have the technology. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, and I completely agree with that. I there. I think it would be so wonderful for L and Granite and Noah to be able to go to a place though and see themselves celebrated. Absolutely, that's what I feel like is yes, lost here. I agree, but it it's almost made up for in the in the sense that their on their aunties and uncles and grandparents can watch it where they're at in their homes, you know, so I, at, there's a bit of a balance there, a little give and take. But there could have been both. Could That's have been the, both. There could have been both. Yeah. They, we, and they, maybe they, there still will be. They shouldn't know? have had to choose that one. <laughs> they could have traveled and yeah. felt that celebration and their aunties and yes. uncles and relations could have, um, could have, you know, streamed it and later in the film's life, even perhaps. Yeah, yeah. and and There's had had it. celebrations with them. Yes. So Ronnie Joe, um, and I don't know much about your personal life or your family life, but I know you have children. I do. And are they a little older? Are they're twenties, yeah, thirties. Yeah, I have, I have, I have, all my children are, are in their thirties. Okay. That's how you what? know I'm old. Have they seen the film? What are their no, thoughts? No, they on haven't this seen new... the film. Okay. But they know I keep telling them I'm a big time producer now and they just roll their <laughs> eyes. Um, and. But they're very excited for me, but they do want to see. Obviously, they want to see it. Um, my husband has sat through almost every time I've really I've watched um, wow. the, you know, done my um, viewing for mm -hmm. to give feedback. He's. He sat through with me um, and, and he's a very quiet man. He doesn't really say much, but, um, but he's enjoyed it. And um, so, yeah, I'm excited to share it with them. I, well, because I didn't know what the, what the etiquette was. I didn't know like what I could, what I could share with people. So I've just been, I've been keeping it on <laughs> very like lockdown, like precious. Uh -huh. So um, I didn't know. I, I haven't known what I could just you know hand out to folks yeah I, we wouldn't have 
come after you or anything. <laughs> I guess no one ever said, this is what you can and can't do. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious how your families responded to your filmmaking now, this yeah. new chapter in your professional life. And and I guess it, time will tell when they get to see this film and your other project, how they respond to all yeah, that. Yeah, they're... My family is very supportive of me. They, um, they're they used to me doing um, sort of outlandish things. <laughs> um, you know, when, when, I, when, I was a, when I was a math teacher, I came home one day and I said, I need all the labels off of our food because mm. I was going to be doing some stuff with, um, you know, needing to to know like the ounces and the 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 milliliters and 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 so my husband my kids were and my husband were like all right so we were just like taking all like the labels off the beans and the tomatoes and just like one kid had a sharpie marker and just like was writing down like what was on the cans and like nobody questioned it we're just like mom needs all the food labels this is, normal this, is this is what we're doing um so they know me to be um, that kind of person mm -hmm. that just does, you know, whatever weird stuff. And so, you know. So this isn't a stretch uh, for for their perception of you, you moving into producing films. and Right. Like, oh, yeah. mom <clears throat> is in a pride parade. Okay. Oh, mom is getting her doctorate all right like they're just like all, all, all it's weird and normal all at the same time they just that just that just is how it goes <laughs> that's awesome but i you know like i you know i feel you know i don't you know of course i don't know any of the technical stuff and and sometimes i feel kind of limited by that Although more recently, I've come to realize, oh, I just need to know people who know the technical stuff. That's mm -hmm. that's what I need. I don't need to know it necessarily myself. Um, and that has been that has been really um, liberating um, <laughs> because I was thinking, oh, maybe I've got to go and take a bunch of classes. I've got to take like a, I've got to like learn Photoshop and. I'm going to learn how to edit things. But now I'm like, oh, no, maybe I don't have to do that. I can, I, I, I need to know people who know those things. So that is a very, uh, that is a, a an excellent description of a producer, <laughs> knowing people who know the technical stuff and you guide them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So it's been a lot of fun. I, I've just been having a very, very good time. And I have my my new my new thing is like I'm I'm only taking on things that are weird in this phase of my life. As as <laughs> as an um as an older person, like I've I'm just doing weird things. And I was talking to a woman just right before the pandemic hit, um, a uh, a friend of mine who is a transgender woman and she said we have to do a project together and i said absolutely my only rule is it has to be weird and she said all right well we'll come up with something i said I, we will <laughs> and we'll come up with a weird thing well, let's do it so that's my that's my rule for myself <laughs> i'm glad our project was weird enough <laughs> it was just weird enough that's a wrap that's all good <laughs> Yeah, no, this is great. <laughs> that is a wrap. Thanks for listening. To find out who our next guest is and to stay up to date on all of our projects and announcements, follow us on all major social media platforms, at Sorrow Films. What makes this podcast distinct is that we put you, the audience, in the driver's seat. Influence the conversation by submitting questions for our guests ahead of each episode via Instagram. Sorrow Films helps in all aspects of the filmmaking process, including funding, production, marketing, and distribution with a focus on emerging feature filmmakers. If you're developing a project you'd like to pitch to us, you can submit it at sorofilms.com forward slash submissions. <laughs> <laughs>